Yes, sir. It's on. Okay, so let's start. So, good morning, good evening to the audience and our guests around the world. Me, myself, Mama Shanawas, president of GBA UE. Misha Hanan, our GBA UE ambassador and our operations manager, Maharaj Madhuram, welcome you from this beautiful city of Dubai. Before we start the discussion uh, today's topic, we want to tell a bit about GBA. GBA or Government Blockchain Association was started in USA in 2016, and we have 50 chapters around the world. Uh, GBA UAE was started around February 2020, and since then we have hosted many thought leaders and blockchain professionals. GBA is a technology agnostic global association whose mission is to promote and accelerate blockchain adoption in public sector via education, advocacy, and innovation. By education, we, we mean that we have niche specific courses uh, in blockchain and legal, blockchain healthcare, cybersecurity, and we also hold at times introductory courses. By advocacy, we, we hold panel talks like we're doing today, and we can learn from experts and thought leaders. And we also organize conferences like we're gonna have the one uh, next year on May, uh, 2021, where more than 400 blockchain and government officials will come from around the world. More on that at the end of the webinar. We innovate, uh, we have some projects which, which are useful for government sector for, and also for, for ourselves. For example, we are made working on DAO working group, uh, which is improving the way different chapters are coordinating and making decisions on blockchain. Before we continue, a small disclaimer, we are not affiliated with any public or private entity. All advice in this session should not be construed as a legal, financial, or investment advice, and should only be used for educational purpose. Any opinion stated in the webinar is the opinion of a speaker and not the organization they are associated with. So with that, we start uh, today's session with a question. Have you ever seen any successful group or organization, it can be hobby group or corporate or nonprofit, uh, operating long term without rules or regulations? Uh, maybe, maybe a few receive without you know, rules, but most of them have a governing body to steer the organization to achieve goals and outcomes. We humans are social creatures and, uh, and we group together. And there's usually when we group together, there's some kind of dynamic that either there's a competition or there's an alliance, you know, we, we basically reach a compromise or there's a cooperation to achieve a certain outcome. Initially for the first 200,000 years, we were nomadic people moving in small groups where majority of time, you know, it was hierarchical top-down approach. And where decisions are made by few or, or one person, decisions like, you know, what, what to hunt, you know, where, do we settle down the simple decisions? So tasks are really, really simple. But after we settled down our cities and has society grew complex, tax became more complex. It was difficult for one person to, to manage the group and make decisions. Decisions like, you know, where to build, where to build the road, uh, regarding the you know, security army, and most importantly, you know, how to make the rules of decisions change and manage them. So in political governance, we have, uh, we have seen different types like monarchy, uh, direct democracy, where people actively take part in making decisions and representative democracy, which is majority of country follow, where a group elects somebody to present them and also republic. Similarly, there are other forms of governance in different sectors where wherever people collaborate, like uh, and, uh, for example, corporate governance, nonprofit governance, any group, that collectively makes decisions, you know, implements them, and and in the process manages uh, and make the change, manages the change of decisions, uh, requires governance. So governance, in short, is 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 the way rules, norms, and actions are structures structured, and sustained, regulated, and held accountable. So today we we are mainly uh, so today has the technology with technologies like telephone, internet. It has helped us to easily spread information across barriers. You know, we with the early internet uh, or web 1.0, 
It has helped us to communicate with each other and share ideas. Then with the advent of social media like Facebook, LinkedIn, or web, what we call a web 2.0, we, it was easy for us to form groups and communities and discuss those ideas. With the invention of blockchain, where it has for first time enabled us to share something, share something of value, something unique over the internet. It has given birth to Web 3.0, where it's enabled uh, those, these communities not only share value, but they also help them collaborate and communicate. And to go from just from discussion tangible action. Today's topic, uh, today we want to really talk about enterprise blockchain. What I mean by enterprise uh, is like enterprise is like any government or multinational entities with strong governance. And we see how to create a framework for different stakeholders that have different interests to work together uh, on, on a blockchain and how decisions are made, changed to achieve certain outcomes. We have experts today uh, from private and public enterprise blockchain. Our first guest is Thomas Fox. He is the chief commerce officer of StrongBlock, which is a blockchain service platform and consultancy. He has more than 30 years experience in IT industry and has worked for Oracle, IBM, and was a VP of product for BlockOne, which was the company that released EOS blockchain. He also chairs IEEE's P2145 Working Group, which is a working group for blockchain and DLT governance standards. And is a, he is the lead host of the enterprise, also leads a, a podcast, Enterprise DLT Live Podcast. He's also known as the, rightfully known as the godfather of blockchain governance. Our second guest is George Carrasco. He's a director of emerging technology of Edisola Digital, where he focuses on disrupting industries uh, using a combination of blockchain, telco capabilities, and has more than 10 years of international experience across Europe, Middle East, uh, building and managing digital solutions across uh, different domains. Our third guest is Red Otkirk uh, Poole. Uh, he's CEO of EuroChain which is a GDPR compliant blockchain supporting US uh, blockchain. Uh, he's, he has more than 25 years of experience in cybersecurity and is an entrepreneur and investor in cybersecurity and blockchain companies. Misha Hannan is who's the one moderator, is a CEO of Deep Tech Dive uh, Tech, which is, uh, provides enterprise grade blockchain platform as service and iRangers, also CEO of iRangers, uh, which is an international business technology consulting firm he has more than 30 years experience in IT and cybersecurity and also has a podcast named State of Innovation Podcast. So uh, welcome, gentlemen. Um, and today's agenda is, is a presentation by, by Thomas, uh, first 20, 25 minutes, and then we're going to have one hour panel discussion. Audiences, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to type on the chat box. So I'll hand over to you, Thomas. My presentation. Over to you. Standing, thank you very much. And I will uh, put into chat the notice that um, I will almost certainly uh, make you think of more questions faster than I'm answering them, especially okay. at first. So as questions occur to you, just type them in chat. Don't try to hold them in your head and don't wait for me to answer them. Type them into chat. And then if I haven't answered by the end of the first 15 or 20 minutes, I'll circle back uh, and grab that. And odds are good that some of my friends here I see on the call, uh, Janine, uh, see Dan is here from uh, Symbiont, hey Dan, and Chris, uh, Wendy, folks who are in active in uh, standards creation with me. Uh, some of them know this stuff as well as they're better than I do. So th they may chime in with good answers as well. But if you have questions, you will get them answered here today. If only you champion your own questions and ask them. Okay. And on that thought, I will give you my Introductory remarks. Um, I want to talk about the four forces. The four forces are not the only way to look at governance, but I find it a useful framework. Uh, and it's one that uh, I've used in the past. Uh, you'll, you'll see in a second what, what those forces are and why they're interesting. Uh, you already know the background on me. And what this presentation covers, uh, happy to give you a copy of the slides if you'd like, is the fundamental nature of blockchains is they are collectives. 
And if you aren't super clear on what the word collective means, you're going to need to be, if you want to understand the nature of blockchains and distributed ledgers. And if you don't understand that nature, you will struggle with governance. And once you grasp the collective nature of the enterprise, you'll, you'll start to get it pretty quickly. Uh, number two, I'll talk about uh, the essentials of governance for blockchains and DLTs. And then I'll touch on how to use the four forces. And then I imagine we'll go in all kinds of fun directions after that because we have a, a wonderful panel. The, the fundamental point I try to make to people is you cannot scale your system, uh, your blockchain or your DLT system without governance. And yet we see it again and again that people build proofs of concept, they put their reputations on the line, they uh, spend lots of money and time and energy building the technology side. They utterly neglect governance because there aren't like cool articles in coin, coin blank, whatever website you're reading about and to, to talk about it. So you think, well, it's all about the technology. I gotta get the right, you know, I gotta do the right consensus algorithm that that'll fix everything. And then they neglect governance and then they can't scale it. And we'll talk about why you can't scale without governance here in just a sec. So here are the three truths. These are three universal truths. I remind um, people younger than me of this periodically and sometimes myself. Uh, you can phrase it as we are here, it is now, and this is the way things are or we are here, it is now, and this is our starting point, whatever this might be. And if you don't think that you are where you are, or if you don't think that you're in the moment, if you try to live in the past, if you try to live in the future, if you try to start from a starting point other than where you actually are right now, you are set up for failure. You know, if only I hadn't married that person, if only I hadn't taken that job, but you did, okay? If only we, I don't care about if only. We are here, it is now, this is our starting point, now what are we gonna do? So let's talk about what that means for us. We are here in that means blockchains are coming. Um, they're getting increasingly mature. The software is ready. It is absolutely, it's gonna get better, but the software is ready for prime time today. You can solve real problems today. Uh, it is now, there is a worldwide crisis in credibility and trust. Institutions, organizations, firms of all kind need new ways to prove their integrity because we are seeing again and again that uh, Systems are being corrupted. Uh, average everyday people are being ripped off right, left, and center by people who are in positions of power and positions of trust and are untrustworthy. Uh, and our starting point is that blockchain products keep failing. And they fail, you know, best and brightest people in the company or in the firm or in the organization go off and stake their reputations on a blockchain solution. They get partway in, the thing collapses because they can't get anybody to, to, to sign up once they prove the technology goes end to end. And it's all caused by weak and missing governance in the vast majority of cases. So let's not do that anymore, please. So let's look at some perspectives on blockchain. What if you're the uh, founder or early adopter? What do you want to demand of your blockchain system? Well, it's got to create value for somebody. It's got to scale past proof of concept. So if someone's inviting you in or you're, you're one of the first people, Demand this of your, of your design. Look at it very critically. If it's not clearly creating value for somebody, if it's like yet another altcoin or yet another uh, DeFi project or yet another fill in the blank, and it doesn't do something interesting and create value for somebody, scrap it now. Um, if you're a late adopter, look first at the governance and ask yourself, how are my interests protected against my competitors? Can other people read my traffic? Even if they can't read the messages, can they read the volume of traffic between me and another party and, deduct, and sort of deduce like, who am I doing business with? Uh, how does the system handle black swan events? If it's not clear from the governance design, don't join. If you're a regulator, uh, you've got to need, you need proof that this is not going to be a vehicle for uh, collusion or coordination against customers and consumers. And if you're a customer, you want to demand that the system has hard protections for your privacy, uh, for your interests. Uh, it's got to allow for disputes, dispute resolution. It must handle lost key replacement, for instance. You'd be amazed how many systems can't even replace a lost uh, private key. It's nonsensical. All right. I mentioned earlier that blockchains are collectives. If you walk away with nothing other than this understanding, you will be much uh, further along. A block, every blockchain is a collective. What do we mean by collective? A collective is any organization where the members, whether they're individuals or firms, for-profit, non-profit, uh, governments, whatever, the members agree to give the group power specifically to reach less than unanimous decisions 
that bind everyone universally. All the members have to go along with whatever the group decides. And if that seems like, oh my God, wait a second, they're all gonna vote against me and I'm going to have to start driving on the other side of the road or I'm gonna to have to start, you know, I'll have to change all my electrical sockets or I'll have to change some, it's like, yes, that's right. If, if, they have, if you give them the power to do that and you agree to follow the rule, follow the majority rule or whatever the rule is, correct. And um, there's reasons why things like the uh, European Union have structures that require unanimity. It's very hard to get there, but it means people have faith and belief in the decisions. But most collectives, most of the time, have at least some things that are decided less than unanimously and you'll be bound anyway. And that's what you're signing up for. You're also signing, well, this could be on specific topics, not everything usually. And they might use different decision rules for different classes of decision. They also have the power to compel us as individuals or organizations to honor the group decision. We're bound and we're compelled. Now they can throw us out uh, or levy fines or, or do whatever. And the collective can change the rules of the game. So you might join one set of rules and you discover, wait, we just changed, the, when did we change that rule? Uh, and suddenly you're now having to follow a different, a different game with a different set of rules and you're still in the game. So be careful when you get in here. The benefits of better outweigh the risks. And don't just think you're gonna put on, oh, we'll do voting and it'll fix everything. It's not just voting. If, you know, otherwise you get two wolves and a sheep voting on what they have for dinner. And if you set it up like that, everyone's gonna look at that and think, I'm gonna be the sheep one of these days and they're gonna tear me apart and devour me. Uh, so don't think naively that, oh, I've got on-chain voting that fixes all my governance needs. No, it does not. Uh, please don't imagine that. Let's dive a little bit more into what a collective is. <sighs> two columns. Is it easy or hard to get to unanimous agreement? And is it okay for the group to split in two directions or do we have to stick with a single direction? Can we split up and do multiple things or is there one thing? For instance, um, is it okay for us all to have different things for lunch? Yeah, totally. Um, is it okay for us all to have different national security policies even though we're all members of the same country? Uh, not really. Uh, you know, can I pick my own tax rate? No, only if you want to adjust your income. Uh, and so there's areas where it's one size fits all. And there's other areas where you can d diverge safely. Okay, look at how these interact. If it's easy uh, to get to unanimity and it's okay to split the group into pieces, then it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, if it's easy to get to unanimous, we're in the left-hand column, and it's not okay to split into you know, up and in, in, in scatter, then okay, fine, we'll just talk until we agree because it's easy to get to agreement because we're in the left-hand column that says that it's easy. And so if a small group of three, four people wanna to go to lunch together and they can't quite agree on which restaurant to go to back when we all went to restaurants, uh, fine, you just talk about it for a while and then eventually you know, you'll, you'll settle on something sooner or later because you don't wanna to go to different restaurants and not sit together. The whole point of the group is to get together and share a meal. Um, but sometimes it's hard. And if it's hard to get to unanimous, but it's okay to split up, then we're in the market column, right? We're in that market cell where you're just like, let's go to a food court. There's 30, 40, 50 people. We're all gonna have lunch. We'll go to a food court. Everyone goes to a different little kiosk. Everyone gets whatever they want. And then we all come to the tables and sit together and we have, we have our meal, right? The markets are great for that kind of thing. Markets don't fix everything. They fix a lot, but they don't fix everything. If you were in the lower right-hand corner, you're in collective choice. And collective choice theory was invented by uh, McCulloch and Buchanan uh, only a few decades ago. And it's something called The Calculus of Consent, which is an unreadable book, but it was groundbreaking at the time. I suggest reading a summary, not the original. Uh, and they spawned two or three different academic disciplines just from collective choice theory, because even though we've been working in collectives for thousands of years, we don't have strong theory about it until very, very recently. So what's governance? It's a system of making collective decisions. We just talked about what a collective is, right? It's one size fits all. We all have to go along with it. Um, it's also carrying the decision out. So it's not enough to make the decision. It's like, you know, the European Union or, or some consortium announces, we've made a decision. And they put out a press release as if that's all they have to do. It's like, but they, and then a year later, nothing's been implemented, right? It happens all the time. 
So you got to not just make the decision, you got to carry it out. Hopefully it's auditable, it's verifiable, it's accurate and so on. And governance includes changing the rules of the system. Uh, and so it's a, kind of a, an ongoing dance across these three pieces. You might also think of it as the collective management of emergent issues. Because if it was a totally predictable issue and low level, you just write some code for it, or you just have some well-known, well-thought-out process that everyone already agrees to. You know, how do we, how do we weigh things? Well, a thousand years ago, you might have a fight over how to weigh things. Nowadays, it's easy. You get digital scale, and, and you know, we've got weights and measures figured out internationally. Uh, it's the emergent stuff that's hard, and it's what'll kill your system if you don't have an arrangement for how to handle that issue when it emerges. Scope of governance. I need to skip over some things. Um, so here's an example. Let's say you got 20 people, they're all gonna share five large pizzas. Um, you can imagine how long it'll take there for like 20 people to come to agreement on which, which the pizzas are gonna be and like what toppings. Some of you guys don't eat pizza, I know. Uh, I need gluten-free, so I'm gonna cause trouble. Uh, I like anchovies, nobody else likes anchovies. So it's gonna be a mess. Great, we get the agreement, someone has left to place the order. Where do we order it? Who's got the money? Who's paying? Wait, do we have plates? What, what did, nobody has napkins? What? I'm going to make a mess here. So we've got all these implementation details. And then like, we didn't like how that worked. We want to do it again later. We'll do it in a different way. Now I want to talk to you briefly about how governance interacts with your technology. Because I hinted earlier that technology is pretty solid. You can build DLTs today with off the shelf software. And they're, they're not that hard to think through. Solidity is still difficult to write, but in, in many ways it's a solved problem. But what happens if your technology is strong or weak and if your governance is sufficient or insufficient, right? Let's look at those four cases. If you've got insufficient governance and weak technology, the whole exercise is pointless and I suggest you scuttle the project immediately. If you think that you're in the bottom row with strong technology, but you're in the left-hand column with insufficient governance, I warn you, your proof of concept is gonna stall out and the stakeholders will not engage because they won't see how their interests are protected. If you're in the right-hand column with good, strong governance, it's more than good enough, and there's a technology problem, your stakeholders are bought in. They'll help you with the technology. And if you then get into the case where you're in the strong technology and good governance, you can scale this up and you can succeed. Uh, I'm seeing like 5% success rates with projects right now. It's really scary, which is not in uh, So I suggest these design steps and I have to give you guys a copy of this. If you want me to like, you know, talk to your group or something offline and go into detail, I can't do it now, but I'm you know, just ping me, I'll, I'll give you some time. Uh, don't feel you have to like take a lot of notes or, or take screenshots too much. It, here are the steps. You figure out who your founders are, have a purpose, know what, what value you're creating, define the scope of the governance, right? What's in scope, what's out of scope. You know, if I've got bankers on board, are it, is the governance system gonna set interest rates or do the banker set interest rates independently? Pretty important to decide that up front. Uh, no banker will join if they have to give up control of their interest rates when they join, odds are, unless it's a very, very special consortium, for instance. So scope's huge. Uh, who's my target stakeholders and what are their interests? And then I get to define my governance powers, processes, and institutions. You know, how do we, uh, set the terms of engagement. How do we uh, update a broken smart contract? How do we replace a, a lost key? How do we set policy X or Y? And you set up your mechanisms and write your code. You can also look at it this way from left to right. Um, there's a set of pre-constitution decisions to make kind of in this pink color. Uh, that's all during proof of concept. You should have that nailed before you try to leave POC. Then you've got constitutional decisions to be made. That is your structure of your governance. Uh, and at that point, halfway through constitutional decisions, you're probably exiting POC. Uh, you're, you're, in, you're ready to scale at that point. If you don't make the constitutional decisions, you will never scale. Uh, you then have what might be called legislative decisions. You don't change the structural rules, but you are making substantive, uh, interesting uh, decisions. And then ongoing operational decisions. And you'll loop backwards in time as, as you need to. But this is generally how things get more refined over time. Uh, so during proof of concept, you want to set your governance pattern both for the POC phase and the governance for the scaling phase. 
We want to set up a transition trigger in the process. At what point do we stop having the, uh, the appointed board and go to an elected board? Because you can't have an elected board with no members, that's meaningless. But at some point you get 20, 30, 40 members, they're gonna be like, why are we still working with the same five appointed people? That's not making sense to me. Uh, so when do you tell them in advance, write it down, commit to it. Then during scaling, you're gonna transition from that early pattern to a scaling pattern. And here are some patterns. Uh, benevolent dictator for life. Works great early on. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was the benevolent dictator of Bitcoin for a while. At one point he apparently sent an email and said, yeah, there's a bug, everybody replace your code with this new code. And everybody did it. And you know, Bitcoin was worth 0. 0.00001 cent at the time. And he was like, he was still sort of a hobbyist exercise. Everybody did it, no big deal. Uh, Self-appointed board, right? First five people into the project, make up the board. Uh, a duocracy, you may have heard of a duocracy. It's the people who are interested in doing something, go do it. Uh, there's a sub pattern in here called the KYC legal anchor where you have a know your customer process and people sign a legal contract and expose themselves to legal liability, um, which is not a bug, it's a feature. Um, the ability to be sued is one of the be best things you can do for your customers for them to trust you more. If you can't find me and sue me, you can't trust me as much as if you can totally find me and totally sue me. And you know where I live and you know where I'm incorporated and I've got a performance bond and I've, got, I've exposed myself to all kinds of uh, uh, accountability mechanisms to you. And now you're like, oh, I got pretty good leverage over this guy. Yeah, I'll, I'll trust him with my project. Yeah. And then you, the scaling patterns are things like, uh, these are rare, jury, uh, circles or sociocracy. It's one of my favorites sort of academically, but hardly anybody uses it. Uh, petition is another one. Elected boards, the most common. Uh, it's been called trios politicas, where you've got an executive, a legislative, and a judicial. Uh, again, I, most of us will get by fine with an elected board. Uh, and there's a website called communityrule.info with a lot more detail on that stuff if you'd like. I find it really interesting. Um, I have an infographic, which I will absolutely not attempt to walk you through in the time available. But if you'd like a copy, just get in touch with me. Uh, but it shows the governance design process in blue, the maturity phases in red, and the center in yellow are some of the documents you might create. Uh, and there's some uh, uh, call outs and details in, in the margins on both sides. And this is the DLT consortium governance formation and scaling process uh, that we've been talking about at P2145 and uh, also at my company, uh, Strongbox. So uh, you might find some use there for kind of a browsing session sometime. Uh, you will, if you're following this um, uh, space at all, if you've been looking at the word governance, you will have run across on-chain versus off-chain and you will have read um, what to my eye are absurd fights uh, that you know, it should be on-chain, it should be off-chain. Um, and let me explain why that's nonsense. Um, parts of governance are automatable. And if you can put them on chain, you might want to. And then again, you might not, but you might. And other parts are absolutely defy being put on chain for very good reason. So let's look left uh, on your screen is more automated, right is less automated. And you can absolutely automate on-chain voting in the collection of say signatures if you need to collect signatures for something like I need 12 signatures to put this on the ballot or uh, this person has to collect a certain number of signatures to run for office or whatever. Easily done on chain. It's hard to do secret ballot on chain. I've yet to see that done. Um, but some form of balloting, absolutely. Uh, tallying the votes, very automatable, absolutely. Enforcing voting periods, voter registration, uh, auto-executing code. Uh, several folks have implemented that. That's great. Uh, it's nice because you vote for one thing and get another out in the world. But here, like what I'm voting on is what's going to execute. And so I actually know what I'm voting on. It's kind of nice. Um, what about log rolling and side payments? Uh, this is one of the ways you get to agreement. It's like, you know, I'm gonna vote for something that benefits you and not me. Why am I voting for this again? Oh, you're gonna do me a favor later. Or we'll bundle in two decisions, one that helps you, one that helps me. Ah, now I'm on board. Okay, but you're not gonna automate that conversation. You might automate pieces of it. Uh, you might automate the execution of it even. But the conversation is probably uh, human to human. Dispute resolution can be automated. Uh, PayPal has over 90% of their disputes handled by an AI but that's only after many years uh, and aspects of it will always have to be done manually. What about campaigning and debating about how you should vote? 
How about me making up my own mind? I'm sorry, I'm not letting a smart contract tell me what to think. Uh, what about setting social norms, which are actually tremendously important, especially in a commercial blockchain where you've got actors who work with each other repeatedly and both cooperate and compete. Uh, without social norms, you can, you can manufacture disputes. With social norms, you can avoid quite a few. What about enforcing social norms? Again, all manual. Governance code changes, automatable, negotiating and writing amendments, uh, manual. So, okay, how much on-chain governance do we get? And the answer is maybe up to half. Uh, and it's entirely up to you which things you do. You can do this all manual. We've done it manually for a thousand years, uh, but pieces of it maybe work on chain. What are some challenges? In every context, we have the principal agent problem. It will never go away. Blockchains can ameliorate it. It can make it somewhat better. It can reduce some of the error cases, but you will never get away from the principal agent problem in some form. Uh, the creation of institutions, going from nothing to something is enormously hard. Uh, I, every time I think I've like, recalibrated in my head how hard it is, it surprises me with how much harder it is. Um, setting social norms will always be a challenge. You've got to get that done early. If you find the social norms are bad, you should probably dissolve the group entirely and start over. It's very hard to repair it once it goes down a bad direction. Uh, social norm enforcement, you gotta know how you're gonna do that. Uh, voter apathy and rational ignorance are huge problems. If you're expecting uh, that people are gonna come to your blockchain or DLT system and cast votes to make decisions, um, Remember when the DAO hack was happening? You may have read about the DAO hack when you know, there was like $100 million or more. It's like one quarter of all Ethereum was locked up in this one contract and it was being ripped off. I'm like, quick, we need to vote on it. Less than 15% of the people, less than 50% of the tokens involved, I should say, actively being stolen from, okay? It's as if your bank calls you and says, yeah, someone's draining money from your account. You want to do anything? And like 85% didn't even respond. And that was an active, like the house is on fire emergency. And that's the only, they got 15% voter turnout. It's insane. So you cannot count on voters showing up and paying attention to governance issues on a routine basis. They will have apathy. They will have rational ignorance. You're gonna to have to do something else around that. And especially on public chains, the lack of oracles for outside data, you know, it, and especially, let's say I've got a, an insurance contract that pays out when a flight is delayed. Okay, then I have to go to the FAA or some external oracle to be told on chain, like, was a flight late or not? And how hard is it gonna be to hack some government website and have it lie to my blockchain just long enough for it to issue a payment? Yeah, so um, like I say, we got issues. Oh, and if you have a public chain with a lack of agreed direction or a lack of agreed purpose, you will never ever steer it anywhere. So I mentioned the four forces, we'll wrap up with this. Uh, according to Lawrence Lessig, and I love his model, there's four forces that constrain human behavior on a technology platform. The first is market forces, next is legal forces, next is social forces, and last is the code itself. And you can think of this as, you know, how do you prevent uh, a kid from stealing a bicycle? Well, market forces would say that the, the value of a stolen bicycle could be very low, and so there's no incentive, or the value of stolen bicycles might be very high, and then there's a high incentive, so market forces can go either way. Legal forces, he could get in trouble, go to jail, get arrested, get in some kind of trouble. Social forces, what if his parents or his friends will, you know, have demonstrated that they don't respect theft, and they think it's bad, and if they find out he's stolen a bike, that they'll all, like, shun him and shame him. No, well, that'll, that'll affect your behavior as a kid. And then code, well, what if the bike is locked up? Oops, I guess you're not stealing that. And so that's how the four forces work. Bitcoin just has code and market forces. And in fact, the code, the proof of work algorithm creates the market force. It is more cost effective to be honest than to cheat the, uh, the proof of work algorithm. There's a little bit of external legal stuff. If you steal enough Bitcoin, the cops will come after you but it's, there's nothing on chain for that. And so if you look at it here in a grid, uh, the issue on the left of minor validator misbehavior, there's nothing on chain for legal, there's nothing on chain for social. The market forces are that proof of work rewards honest mining and the code is what enforces that. Uh, what about deciding on upgrades, the middle row? 
Well, there's a social norm that people yell at each other on social media. And that's apparently how they make decisions by yelling at each other. And the market impact there is that the token price could tank if you don't fix your bugs. Uh, and then ultimately the code says that what enough miners actually do is what happens. So it's very deterministic and the code manages all that. And then theft is entirely uh, off-chain uh, law enforcement. But you can do it differently. Look at VeChain. Uh, VeChain validator misbehavior, they have KYC and legal contracts. You can't be a validator on VeChain without signing up, doing KYC and putting in a deposit, buying a whole bunch of tokens that you're now exposed to the token price. And they can come after you for breaking the contract. They can sue you in court. They can take you to arbitration or mediation uh, and so forth. And of course, on chain, you can see who did what when. So if you're as a validator doing things like front running, it's kind of obvious, right? I mean, everyone sees the audit trail that is the blockchain. What about if the, the, the guiding council, they have a, an elected board, so that's their structure. What if that board or council is corrupt? Well, they're under contract, you can sue them. Uh, there is a social contract. They're all exposed to the token price and there's biannual elections. So you can always throw them out. And then deciding, you get the idea. And so you can work through any set of problems for your chain. I'll jump to the end here. Grain chain's a great example. Meta ledger's a great example. Uh, what about your chain? Well, throw up on the left the big issues you've got, put in four columns and ask yourself and ask the people you're working with and maybe your, your target audience of who you wanna to recruit to your chain and say, how shall we do this? And then once you've got that baked, now you're ready to go to market and say, here's our current governance. Here's how we're going to protect your interests. And when you can say that with accuracy and completeness, when you can tell people, here's how we're going to protect your interests, you've got pretty darn good governance. So what are the lessons? Don't skip governance. Don't overbuild governance either. Don't underbuild it. Overly elaborate is even worse in some ways than insufficient. Uh, do ask for help. Please use a process and use the governance system itself early and often. So as soon as you've got a board, start using the board to make decisions. Make people use the governance system because if they never use it and then there's an emergency, they're not familiar with it and it feels alien and they don't trust it. But if you force them to use it, maybe you even manufacture a little crisis. Don't tell them I said that, but you might. Uh, you'll force them to have some emergency vote and then they get used to, oh, that's how we handle emergencies. Then you get a real emergency and they're like, oh, I know what to do now. This is why we have fire drills, right? Is to practice the systems so that we're not trying to learn them when we need to use them. So that's my guidance. Obviously, John, you can reach out to me after we're done here, but I'd much rather answer your questions here and now. And thank you very much for paying attention to my presentation. Thanks, 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 Thomas. Uh, I just have a quick question, you know. Um, how do you One? Know? I have many, but, <laughs> but I have to start the panel. Uh, actually, lots. Um, how do you know how much is so much? How do you know you're overbuilding or underbuilding governance? Uh, you probably need outside uh, expertise. Um, you know, have a... Okay a loose cadre of, of friends and advisors who aren't in love with you and aren't in love with your project. Because the people who are in love with it, oh, it's great, it's wonderful. Um, don't have it built primarily by people who were in student government when they were kids. Because they're like, oh, we, we need this committee, we need that committee. And they'll get, they'll get incredibly elaborate and it's just, it's hideous. Um, um, much as I love the sovereign people, S-O-V-R-I-N, their governance model is so elaborate um, like, I'm not stupid. I spent several days trying to understand their system and I couldn't, couldn't figure it out. And that wasn't in the heat of any sort of an emergency. So mm -hmm. I, I, I fear they may have overbuilt. Um, if you can't explain it to a, a moderately intelligent middle schooler, uh, it's probably too much. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. How long did it get to get the definition going? Is the collective management of emergent issues? I read like 10, 20 different books and I believe that this definition is very apt. You know, it says so much with so less, you know. Um, it's so taken me three you... years to boil it down to that shortest sentence. And it, oh, 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 yeah. You know, it said three, uh, uh, three footnotes or three words. All right, okay. 
Uh, so thanks, thanks Thomas for the presentation. Let me ask more uh, during the panel talk. Uh, so uh, I would, uh, I would, I know I introduced uh, uh, George and Red and, and Misha. Um, I would ask again uh, to this time to basically introduce yourself and and what projects you know, which sector you worked on in, in the blockchains uh, project. So I would go first with Thomas. Always with Thomas. I'm sorry, you, I was noticing someone in chat and I wanted to answer there. I'm not, I didn't really yeah, hear yeah, So, so uh, just, uh, I know you introduced yourself, but I would uh, love to know which sector or which blockchain projects you worked on. So so I could ask a follow-up question during the panel talk, yeah. Just right, uh, gosh, I, mean, I wish I'd made a list. Um, uh, fi finance, supply chain, medical, um, mm -hmm. oil and gas, um, I'm trying to think of something I haven't done, fast moving consumer goods, um, mm -hmm. kind of all over the place. I, I've had the good fortune to be able to talk to and, and assist people on many projects. So I've had, I've had pretty broad exposure, not very deep in some cases, uh, very deep in others. So um, I think that anybody who's got a need for coordination uh, or some kind of shared some source of truth across, even inside a company, uh, huge opportunity for blockchain. You need an example, there's a, a bank one bank and they want a blockchain. They're thinking, you're just one entity. What, why do you need, what? Why would you need a blockchain? You're just one company, use a database. And the answer is they've already got lots of databases. That's the problem. What they want is something that all the departments and divisions can put data into, but no one controls. So it is, mm -hmm. it's very tamper resistant. And they mm -hmm. want to be able to track their customer as one individual with entries in some of these other databases. So they can, when the customer calls, mm. they can verifiably say, oh, you're the customer of these three accounts, as opposed to, uh, I'm not sure which accounts you've got. And then they have to like redo the identification. Oh, let me, okay, now let me open your, your bank account. Okay, now what's mm. your mother's maiden name? And then they go, okay, now look at your mutual funds. Oh, uh, what's your secret password? What's mm. your PIN? And they have to like keep re-authenticating the person to go into different systems. It's insane. And the customers hate it and the, and the support people hate it. But they've got all these legacy systems that are so divided for security purposes that there's no unified customer layer. And so that alone is a great blockchain identity uh, application. Uh, in fact, there's a, a, a client of mine, Liquidus, uh, is working on that right now. They do very interesting, do very interesting things. So... Um, we're seeing lots of people need this, I guess is the short version. Okay, fantastic. Uh, George, uh, can you, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, so uh, this is a very interesting question. So the, the, the good part of working from, uh, from a telco company is that uh, basically your role in this type of uh, blockchain initiatives is to work on the governance, right? To be the third party that enables all those organizations to uh, achieve their goals and their and their use cases and their and their requirements. So specifically, uh, we have uh, and and uh, we we have had experience on the finance industry, on the retail industry, which is very related with supply chain, uh, on the education industry, where there are also many use cases around around blockchain. So that that is another, that is another one. And then uh, many others that, uh, for example, Thomas was uh, saying before that not so many projects uh, pass the POC stage. So there are so many other industries where we have thought about the governance, thought about how those projects should go on, but, but unfortunately they do not get uh, traction, right? So quite a few uh, industries and uh, hope we can discuss about the differences and particularities of those uh, during the session today. Fantastic. Then, uh, Rhett, you're here. Yes, I'm here. Yes, fantastic. Uh, so, Rhett, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, my background in, in blockchain is uh, we are a block producer. EOS Amsterdam is a block producer for multiple chains. And uh, myself and five other block producers, four other block producers, together with five, five block producers, we launched the Europe chain. We are also working on launching a chain for India. Uh, so basically everything that Thomas uh, talked about, uh, we, we have hands-on experience in, in doing that. Uh, we are running those chains and on those chains are clients. 
uh, we, particularly the Europe chain and the chain for India, is uh, focuses on, uh, on enterprise adoption. So we have supply chain customers, we have customers from banking industry, so all kinds of customers that are building applications that uh, at the end need to be on our chain. Mm -hmm. We supply them with uh, legal expertise, technical expertise and governance expertise. Um, our Europe chain is uh, GDPR supporting, so that is an area that uh, a, lot of, a lot of people have a lot of interest in mm -hmm. because the right to be forgotten and the blockchain are two, con two concepts that are in, in the eyes of many uh, very difficult to, uh, to unite. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we use the EOS IO software and that has some strong capabilities to, uh, to fix that basically. It's so, public, right? EOS is public. Yeah, yeah. Uh, EOS. Public domain, that's correct. EOS is a public chain. Uh, the EOS IO software is the software um, underneath that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are block producer for nine chains that all use the same software. Usually, they uh, some of them are a little bit um, uh, changed. It's just, the, the tech is a little changed. Mm -hmm. uh, in all situations, the governance is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, depending on their uh, history, you could say the social norms are different, mm. and due to market forces, mm. um, some are uh, uh, like the EOS, EOS chain is very expensive, and there's uh, like the Telos chain that's relatively very cheap. Mm. Um, so market forces create an interesting dynamic as well for that. So I, I can relate to what Thomas explained on the. A child with a bicycle, it's almost the same as, uh, as my business in, the, in this blockchain business. And what, that's being kind of modest. Uh, his organization also <laughs> created uh, something called WordProof, which is like it's tremendous building block. It's a plugin for WordPress, which is the simplest thing in the world. And it anchors each article to a hash on a blockchain. So if anybody changes what they've written, it breaks the hash. And you can tell that the article has been tampered with or vice versa, you can prove that it hasn't been. And it can prove like who wrote what when. Uh, and so they've got a whole bunch of really interesting building blocks. I love EOS Amsterdam for that reason. They're very, very Yeah, we, 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 I, one of the things that we're really proud of is, a, is an app that we call Fact, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is a, basically is blockchain in your hand. With uh, low code software, we can very easily make a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So who wants to order pizza? Uh, it's very easy to make a, a workflow for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's that you could include voting in there. Um, we ha when COVID came up, we made several questionnaires on your health. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very easy to make questionnaires and, and put the results, either individual questions or the, the total answers on chain, uh, whether it's a public chain or a private chain, uh, basically, we have a, a handheld application that you can really, really strongly use uh, in relate in relations to a, a blockchain database, blockchain architecture. I'm really looking forward to the project where I can deploy Fact as one of the pieces. It's, it's going to be very cool. When well, I was in my almost, 20s, almost. I worked part time as a, as a security guard, and you just like walk around and prove that you yeah. walked your beat. And with yeah. Fact, you could like go to a barcode and say. I proved on chain at this date and time. Here I was at this part in yeah. my little rounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it has, yeah, it, in fact, it's integrated with your camera. It's integrated with Neil Field Communication. So you can even read some, some devices. Like if you, I don't know, if you're a, a truck driver of a chemical uh, substances and you need to deliver those substances and you need to do a certain check before you can deliver the chemical goods, yeah. uh, you can read the device, uh, you can read the, the settings of a pump uh, yeah. before you, you do anything. So you can basically prove everything that, you, that you're supposed to do. Okay. Uh, it's very interesting. Okay, okay, I'll, let me go to Misha. Misha, can you quickly uh, please, uh, what products you have done, Misha? Misha, you are uh, on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, 
Actually, from a project's perspective, we, are, we were involved in uh, multiple markets and multiple domains, supply chain management, uh, sustainability, uh, financial sector, uh, cybersecurity activities, uh, forensic investigations. So actually, it was quite intense, I would say, in just last three years. Okay, but uh, uh, we, I actually was really, really interesting to hear from Thomas when he said that uh, 6% of the projects really actually, uh, actually succeeding during even uh, by uh, passing the POC. Uh, I, wa I was under impression that it's even less than six. Okay. It, it might be actually. <laughs> it's bad. And, uh, it is bad. Yeah. And uh, like uh, we, we even were in situations where I was personally stepping in a project after someone uh, to review. And um, my first question was why you even started with this? Okay, like uh, it was no sense at all to do it. Mm -hmm. And on another hand, also like uh, we we get involved in uh, uh, many different projects where we help companies to become digital. I don't like the buzzword of the digital transformation. I don't believe in the digital transformation. I can accept uh, digital evolution, mm -hmm. but uh, not the transformation. Okay, but uh, I do accept the concept of becoming digital. And uh, during the, uh, this evolution, we, we were discussed with, with ma many enterprises around the globe, uh, how blockchain, uh, blockchain foundation can help in particular areas. Um, never considered blockchain as a silver bullet for anything. Okay, and uh, I do believe that um, any technology, especially blockchain, shouldn't be even touched if business doesn't understand the governance, business doesn't understand how to start even with it and how to implement and how to take it through and doesn't see real value mm. in uh, and real problem. Like uh, I've seen many, many, many different blockchain projects where the companies try to build a blockchain solution and then they were looking for the problem. Mm. Like, uh, and this is the like, 120% the case when blockchain yes. project gonna fail. Yep. Okay. So yeah, the, this is our experience. Yeah, one of the big mistakes you can make is you, you try to go and, and have like, oh, we'll, we'll do a small project in a little corner of the company that doesn't really matter. And then great, we just built something that no one cares about. It's like, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Find a nasty hairball that involves coordination and communication across a lot of parties that maybe not trust each other very much and then break off a little piece of it to solve the piece, but make it a real piece that actually matters. The hype is, the hype is uh, finalizing, but still there is a lot of, okay, blockchain, blockchain, everybody's talking about blockchain, let's do something on blockchain. So you, you see less and less of this, but uh, still there is a lot of that. And also uh, there are uh, initiatives that, that uh, inside the companies like let's explore blockchain. And then everybody starts looking at what can we do on blockchain. Without, uh, without considering what is the problem and what is the technology that uh, addresses that problem more uh, in a better way. Yeah. To ensure that many blockchain products are, are solutions waiting for the problem to happen uh, for now. Right. Um, so uh, let's go to the meat of the, of the uh, blockchain governance. Uh, so here's a scenario, a big retail group wants to, you know, uh, uh, get their you know, suppliers in the blockchain so they could track, uh, you know, the, the provenance of different products uh, and make it things easier, reduce the man hours of paperwork. Uh, so, um, so they want to track something from production to the delivery endpoint. Uh, so, what are the you know, uh, what are the major factors critical in formulating a successful blockchain governance in this scenario? Anybody want to step in? Yeah. I would say the first thing I would look at is who actually has to make the biggest changes to their operations mm -hmm. um, and who's got the most to lose or the most to win. Um, and one of the challenges you're going to face is that to really be successful, um, mm -hmm. the blockchain has to be a shared source of truth across many parties. And that means it's not going to be a source of sustainable competitive advantage. Let me repeat that. Your blockchain solution, if it succeeds at scale, will not be a source 
of sustainable competitive advantage because all your competitors should be on the same chain you are because it's a shared source of truth for your industry. Um, and that's like, wait, why am I even doing this then? And the answer is you want to get rid of a class of problems so that you can focus in a different area and be competitive somewhere else. Instead of fighting over where is my container in international shipping, how about we make that not an issue for anybody? And then we can talk about like customer service or um, speed of ships or, uh, uh, you know, I won't break your container because I handle it better, right? I and mean, that's, that's a competitive advantage. Um, but it's a little counterintuitive that we're going to invest a lot of time and energy in harmonizing our systems and redoing our internal processes all to have no competitive advantage. Very strange. Mm -hmm. uh, the good news is that not everyone adopts equally fast. And so you can have a, maybe a multi-year advantage before the others catch up or you buy them after they go bankrupt because they have a blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, I would look at this and say, who can um, just do plug and play and who has to really invest? And it might also be hardware, right? Um, you might have to have RFID readers. You might have to have um, capital investment. Um, yeah. I mean, ocean carriers, Maersk took the lead on that and just built it out. Um, banks will almost never lead anything. Banks are extremely uh, slow to adopt new technology. I would never put a bank in, in, in a consortium if I could avoid it. I would love George's opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, so the, you, you have started with, uh, I would say, one of the most difficult examples because you are touching here so mm -hmm. many different industries. This is not like a, a consortium exactly. that you make on, on, on equal industry players that are trying to solve an issue. You are touching here so many different industries, right? So if you're talking about the banks in this, mm -hmm. in this supply chain, that there are, we, we know there are uh, consortiums out there to uh, for for trade finance, right? To to deal with letters of credit, open accounts, documentation that is around these processes. Mm -hmm. Then you are talking here about shipping and customs, so they have a complete different uh, mm -hmm. problem in this in this whole ecosystem. Yeah, they, so they can build a consortium on their own for all the documentation, the the huge amount of documentation that is transacted for these supply mm -hmm. chains to work, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have the uh, exporters or the or the manufacturers, which have again all the different problems, which is uh, about offering their 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 customers uh, reliable sources of, of information about the product the product that they manufacture. And then you have the 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 last part of the chain, right, which is the retailers or the or the companies that will receive the goods. So they, they have a complete different problem, which is having end-to-end -end visibility. Where are my uh, goods? Uh, is, is there any problem that I can anticipate to, to, to uh, shorten the, the time, the whole process takes, et cetera? So I, I don't think uh, we will ever see, or, or at this stage, we will see a, a consortium involving all these stakeholders. We will see consortium of retailers. We will see consortium of shipping agents, we will see consortium of customs, even at the international level. And um, I think we will touch base on this later in the, in, the, in the panel, but there will be a second wave of blockchains of blockchains where mm -hmm. the interoperability yeah. with all these different consortium will play a role, right? But, mm -hmm. but uh, here, uh, uh, coming back to the, to the two questions that Thomas was making, so who makes the most benefit and the, and the and who loses the most by joining here? This is mm -hmm. this is a key question. So, in my opinion, is the retailers will see shorter periods of time, will have less cost of the whole uh, uh, placing orders, transactions, etc. So, so probably those will be the one driving the entire chain to adopt a particular solution, right? And mm -hmm. um, and solutions where one particular industry player gets benefit. For example, at the beginning, I would say TradeLens and Maersk have that issue that Maersk, because they designed the TradeLens solutions together with IBM, then uh, there was a, some sort of resistance from uh, other players to join because that was defined as per Maersk. I think they have solved that, right? But, but um, considering the amount of different players and with this I finish and let the others comment as well, Considering the, uh, so many different players, uh, probably we need to look at a 
consortium of one part of the chain rather than a consortium of uh, players from different parts of the chain. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> anyone want to add it? I probably would add here, uh, especially uh, we right now having uh, quite similar discussion with one of the uh, really big entity here in Dubai mm -hmm. about uh, supply chain and not just a supply chain like in general. And we started the conversation from uh, from uh, from the absolutely different angle. Actually, when uh, when I saw that for the first time the high level diagram of what they want to achieve and what kind of consortium uh, need to be built, it was pretty similar to this one. And uh, our response was, it probably will never happen that those entities uh, uh, will, uh, will join even in, into consortium, like so many different entities, different way, uh, ways of uh, operation, different regulations for all of them. But if, Every participant of this consortium will agree that at least for one benefit, why they really want to step in in this consortium, then it can uh, uh, can somehow play. Okay, and uh, we started to do the calculations and just to see the value if uh, this will be built uh, will be generated just based on streamlining the documentation, not trying to solve all the problem of every vertical for every business that part of this consortium. We started to discuss just one, really one simple, simple problem. It's how to optimize the document, uh, document management, streamline document operation and so on, so on. So we got really to the really interesting point when we uh, received the information for example, how many documents get produced by uh, overall by multiple entities, and then we receive uh, we, we collected information such as uh, what the percentage of the errors inside those documents, and how much it takes to resolve those issues uh, during the year, how many people get involved, so on, so on, so on. We suddenly uh, were able to demonstrate like unheard. Uh, ROI for the, this kind of project. Okay, so we we were we started the discussion from diff absolutely different angle, not about like uh, let's build this consortium just because it's cool to have it, but uh, let's build it uh, ju just to solve some problem. We we were looking for a problem, mm -hmm. and the only way I believe that th this kind of consortium can be built, it's uh, if we have a problem that everybody agrees on it, that this is the problem. Right. Okay, so this is my, my few cents, uh, how I see this kind of consortium can be built. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, thanks for the uh, response. Uh, now, the, now the major question is who's gonna build the cat? Who's responsible for the blockchain governance in this, I mean, usually in this scenario with multi partners and multi corporation joining uh, and why? Well, that's a trick question because in a blockchain, no one's in charge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what you're really saying is I probably, who's convening it to start with, right? Who, who's the initial uh, player uh, followed by, okay, how is that, how is organizing it going to be shared around and who's gonna take the responsibility? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I was a little surprised when I talked to the guys at Auburn University, they're, they do a lot of work for a Walmart because they're located physically near Walmart headquarters. Auburn has an awesome RFID and blockchain lab. Uh, they did a big project that they uh, published the details on, gosh, a few months ago with uh, a couple of really big retailers. And they found that none of the retailers wanted to run their own nodes. They wanted the benefit, but they didn't want any of the work. Um, and so what we're going to find, I predict, is that we're going to have specialist organizations that come into existence that will take on custodianship or stewardship of the, of the chain management. It might be a nonprofit owned collectively by the, by the members. Um, it might be a trade association. Uh, it might be um, some, you know, IBM might have its, you know, blockchain custody division. I don't know how it's gonna play out, um, but there, there's not gonna be one of the players, okay? 
Like Maersk couldn't get anybody to join Trade Lens other than customers that could get any trade partners to join for over a year because Maersk insisted on total control of the governance. Mm. And people looked at that and said, that's not a blockchain, that's Maersk chain. That's the you know, reality according to you. And I'm gonna run my business according to what you say the facts are? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, and so in order to make these fly, you have to relinquish control. You have to relinquish control from the individual company to the collective in a way that's verifiable, trusted. And that is, it's, it's just as hard a problem as anything else is in, in collective work or, or public choice theory. But um, specialist organizations are almost certainly gonna arise who will stitch this stuff together, who will come up with good governance systems, who will you know, convene the meetings. In fact, the Linux Foundation recently announced that they were gonna, they were gonna be a place where people could go to uh, do that kind of hosting. And that they would, you know, convene the meetings and keep the minutes and uh, do some of the the blocking and tackling and the basic work around that. I'm not sure that answers that, your that, question, but that's what I'm hearing. That, that's the core business of, uh, I would say, US Amsterdam. So with Europe Chain, we're providing a GDPR supporting blockchain, so enterprises can run their applications on top. Um, I think we're, we're previously discussing the six percent that had failed projects. My impression is that a big part of that just plain simply started with the wrong technology. Uh, if you start to experiment on Ethereum, you get gas fees. Um, that makes the whole return on investment of your project very strange. Mm -hmm. When you uh, have that on a, <clears throat> a public chain where the right to be forgotten cannot be implemented, it's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, we're talking to a lot of projects right now that have started on Hyperledger, whereas a consortium of like five or 10 people, 10 organizations, and there's like one or two that really understands Hyperledger. That means that there are like eight or nine that do not understand Hyperledger. So these, these one or two that really understands how to do the IT operation of those nodes, they uh, have to to do the, the, uh, basically all the work. They have to run all the nodes. They have to coordinate upgrades. They have to do all kinds of work to do that. So I can, I can relate to what was said that people don't want to do the work, the IT management part of it. So that's why we, we use the EOS IO protocol. And we see one of our uh, block producers is a company called Euracat from Spain. Uh, they are migrating all their Hyperledger projects to us and the block producers in our consortium, they are educated and are capable of making technical governance decisions based on uh, a structure that we've set up. Uh, we have had emergencies, so we, we did the training, as, as Tom has also said, and um, an application just can do the work on the application side and let the and just buy a cloud service decentralized by 21 node operators and and don't worry about the technical stuff they just they can do the the their project and we can run the IT layer underneath it making it a lot easier for them okay okay um, so, uh, so uh, I, I have a question in this case and oh. I think that uh, many people uh, would love to ask this question and uh, ju uh, just for a clarity perspective. Okay, and this actually was uh, on the list of my questions that I prepared for, uh, for this event. And I will try to adjust it even on the, uh, kind of on the fly right now. Uh, as, um, we, we, we actually seen this by, our, uh, by us that majority of enterprises they are not running their own nodes. They, they have, for multiple reasons. Okay, they don't want to do this. It's not their core business. They already migrated to the cloud, whatever. They don't want to do this. They, they don't have expertise in house, many, many, many different reasons, exactly what you just mentioned. However, they're also not willing to use uh, external nodes because in this case, the question that comes right away, they say, wait a second, if I now need to go and start trusting somebody else, well, what the difference it makes uh, if I will use just centralized database 
and keep working with it. Okay, so uh, if you see this kind of uh, behavior from uh, those enterprises, uh, well, what's your play on that? Our, our chain is run and operated by uh, uh, 21 block producers. So it's really a, a, a decentralized architecture um, with, with a bunch of standbys that can, that can rotate. So uh, we don't have that problem. It's, it's really decentralized. Um, my background is cybersecurity. Um, I believe that every database should be architected on a system like that. Um, very recently, Google Cloud uh, became a block producer for EOS mainnet. And that's an interesting step because... No kidding. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If, if, if they realize that to build trusted architectures, they can't be the one that is operating the nodes. They need to be one of the 21. That is interesting because basically, I, I remember when, when customers were asking Google mm. for, and, and AWS for blockchain services, that one of the product managers said, why the hell want, does a customer want this? Because then it's still centralized again. No, yes. to build a distributed architecture, you need at least 15 um, or 50 node operators to do that. So yeah, I'm, I, I agree with you. And, and we just provide that as a service. We, we got together um, uh, the, the block producers from Europe independent nodes, independent companies, in the, like, like the example um, uh, Thomas gave about fee chain where the node operators are, are, are KYC, uh, trusted individuals, trusted companies in, 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 the, in the space. And then a consortium, like the consortium that we're, we have on, on the slide, just they only have to work on their uh, their business plan, their business model, and they just host it on, they just buy a little bit of capacity on the architecture and, and run the project. Mm -hmm. and also, um, we, have, we have thought um, a lot about that. Uh, I would like to add before, before the next question, Mo, uh, because we have thought about uh, a lot about that. So you have basically two, two sources of decentralization. One is the infrastructure, and one is the operations, but in both of them, these are IT headaches for the for the company. So they want to outsource, as as Misha was saying. So yeah. one way or the other, uh, it's easy to um, end on a centralization in, in in any of those two. So from the infrastructure point of view, if you end up having all the nodes on a, on the same hyperscaler or or provided by the same company, uh, you end up centralizing somehow. On the operations side. If you end up having a trusted third party that operates all the nodes, you can uh, also question if that is decentralized. Uh, but the, the 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 point is if if so, this is a um, a, a combination, right? So if if you want to not to have those IT headaches at the end, you need to have a trusted third party that takes all that all those headaches, right? That that is some sort of centralization is 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 uh, is right. But then if that trusted third party offers the flexibility, so for example, some part of the operational uh, tasks uh, still sit on the IT organization of one of the stakeholders, then, then uh, that model is flexible. If on the infrastructure, that uh, trusted third party allows for on-premise nodes versus cloud nodes and, and offers the, an application that can sit on top of uh, Azure blockchain service and Amazon blo uh, uh, blockchain service, etc. So. That, that gives uh, also some sort of confidence. Then the point here I'm trying to make is that, in, especially in a private permissioned uh, blockchain uh, initiative, then uh, uh, those companies uh, probably will, will be more comfortable to join and to, and to concede this operation or this infrastructure if you have a trusted third party that takes all that, all that complexity. And yeah, you can but... call that some sort of centralization but as, as long as that third party offers a um, flexible model, then that will uh, lower the, the anxiety of ending up again on a centralized uh, 
I love it. Yeah, the, the, the model that I see out in the world that makes sense to me is association management. Um, I'm a member of a, a homeowners association, right? I, my wife and I have property and it's part of this HOA. It's an American thing. I think they have in other countries under similar names where I got one building with multiple homes in it and they all share a roof. And so it's a shared roof. And so we can't any one of us do it anymore. We have to do it collectively. And so there's a homeowners association with bylaws and elections. We have to pay homeowners association dues. And they hire a management association to run the website and track the minutes and be the secretary and order the repairs from the, the third party vendor and get the receipts. And it's all auditable and it's all very uh, formalized. Um, and in, in some senses, it's a solved problem. And it's got you know points of attack, right? If the HOA management association is corrupt, they might have kickback schemes with some of the vendors. Uh, and that's why you have third party auditors and inspectors. And it's, we've all done the stance, right? I mean, just go by, go into real estate if you wanna see corruption and, and malfeasance and uh, uh, you know, failed, failed communication and thwarted intentions. Uh, but, and somehow we still keep doing real estate year after year. And the answer is, yeah, people try to steal and lie and there's systems to catch them out. Uh, and that's what we're going to see here is, uh, you know, rather than a trusted third party, it's going to be a series of trusted third parties that get hired and fired and audited uh, and replaced. And there'll be a scandal and everyone will quit them and they'll go bankrupt. And, you know, it's just like the big four accounting firms all over again, uh, only hopefully with blockchain. And, and maybe we can start to, with the encryption and private keys and some of these other technologies, squeeze out some of the sources of corruption, uh, even if we never quite eliminate humanity's ability to lie, cheat, and steal from each other uh, for personal gain. It, it's, it's an age-old dance. It's not going away, but it is taking a new form. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the way to get the most benefit from technology is to you know, take an anthropology class or uh, political science, you know, I mean, really broaden your, your skill set. And uh, read Thomas Schelling's book, uh, The Strategy of uh, Conflict. That's a good book. Uh, and that'll, that'll get your head on straight around, you know, creative ways people have of handling otherwise tough, tough uh, circumstances. Mind-blowing example, I'll give you one. Uh, he talks about a, uh, an area, I think it's in the, the, not the middle, maybe the Far East, desert uh, wasteland, it's hard to travel. It's very, very difficult to, to move uh, valuable parcels across this territory with any confidence um, because there's, you know, people will come up on horseback and steal, ransack caravans and whatever. And there's a tribe that specializes in secure transport. And what they'll do is if you try to t steal from them, they will kill themselves. And that's the, that's the deal. And so no one wants to have that on their hands. It's, it's, it's a source of enormous shame to, to steal from these guys and have them kill themselves. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, you have got to be making this up. This sounds like science fiction, but apparently it's documented. I don't know if it's still true today. Um, but like a whole cast of people arose to handle the specialized need for secure transportation. And it's like, and they would literally like, if you steal from me, I will kill myself. And they would have to do it occasionally to prove that they were serious. Um, and I can't imagine growing up like that or being part of that culture where that's what I would do. But it, it, it led to them having a comfortable living, apparently, you know, except that it didn't. Uh, and that is just one weird niche example of the ways that human ingenuity can overcome or at least address the ways in which we all want to lie, cheat, and steal from each other. Uh, and that's remember that cooperation beats competition. Hmm. Right, I mean, it, it, everybody wants to uh, you know, be secure and there's always people out there trying to steal from you. Mm -hmm. But when you get a small group of, of trusted individuals to band together against the world, you can do amazing things. And cooperation and love always wins. But it's not, it's an uphill struggle, it always is. And so we're just gonna see more of the same. What a great, great insight on this. Um, uh, I would love to move on to the, the topic on managing uh, the chain in blockchain governance. And during this time, I would love to also talk about on-chain and off-chain uh, blockchain governance. Uh, for our audience who doesn't know who is, what is on-chain, uh, blockchain governance, on-chain means uh, all the governance rules and regulations are already codified in the blockchain. 
And off chain, basically you take it offline and decide and decide what to do, what changes to make, and then then implement them. Um, so how do you manage change, blockchain governance change in enterprise blockchain? And second thing is, uh, are there any on-chain enterprise blockchain? Uh, because I never heard of one on-chain blockchain governance. In, uh, there's permission, uh, I mean, public permission level, we have tables and so many other blockchain, but in, in terms of uh, private or public permission, uh, I never heard of of on chain on chain blockchain governance. So one answer there. Well, I did have that slide earlier where I talked about the different pieces of governance and how some things are better on chain or off. Uh, you certainly uh, V Chain is a great example. They do only the final vote on chain. And the thing being voted on is recorded on chain so everyone can see the text of what's being agreed to. Uh, and that makes a ton of sense, right? Now, I don't need every draft to be, you know, on a blockchain immutably for all time. Like, who needs, I don't need, I try not to keep my drafts, okay? They're, they're embarrassing sometimes. But when it comes to the final copy, like, what are we voting on? Yeah, I think it makes sense to have a copy on chain where we can all see it and see who voted for it. And maybe they can record on chain why they did it. Um, because often when you're voting, you're doing something that you're like, I predict this is good, or I'm voting on behalf of my constituency. Uh, and we want those people to be on record uh, mm -hmm. for things like that. So yeah, certain kinds of votes, absolutely. Uh, resolutions, minutes, um, attendance records, totally. Um, the accounting, like where'd the money go? That, I would love to see that on chain. Uh, do I need every single transaction? Maybe. Um, but, and, and, you know, but I wouldn't store all the receipts on chain um, and put those off in uh, IPFS. Um, but then there's, you know, how do you persuade people? Well, uh, a great example is something called the uh, Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative, which was, it looked like an absolutely absurd effort to reduce the level of corruption in the extractive industries, especially in Africa. Uh, and that was like uh, oil drilling and diamond mining and all the extractive industries that go in um, because they have to um, often pay bribes to get the license or get the approval or whatever to, to even just do their work. And if you want to be the one clean, you know, diamond miner who doesn't pay any bribes, you'll be the one diamond miner who doesn't get any mines because you'll never get the approvals because that's how business is done in, you know, fill in the blank country right now. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, you know, the industry as a whole would like to operate in a more lawful environment, but no one can go first. Or so how, it's collective action, it's a collective choice problem. Even the governments themselves are often like, I, you know, our administration would have more legitimacy if we took fewer bribes and had you know, cleaner operations, but we're not sure how to do that. Uh, and so what these guys did over the course of many years was figure out little baby steps to make to increase the level of transparency and reduce the level of corruption. And they've actually had success. Now, they have a rule. They have, two, they have a system for voting and they have a social compact that they never use it. I'll repeat that. Mm -hmm. They have a system for voting. They've got bylaws. They, like, there's a way to vote. Um, and they have literally never used it in all the years they've been operating. Um, they came close once, they did a test vote one time. But the idea is if you do a vote, you're gonna have winners and losers, it's collective action, right? And mm -hmm. so we'd rather have unanimity if we can do it. And, and so there, there's, there's, there's places where you really do wanna force everyone, even if it's hard, especially when it's hard. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. if we can't get the unanimity on the big step, what's the little one? But mm -hmm. let's move forward. Uh, and they have a book on this, it's a lovely book uh, and it's a great story. Uh, it gives me a lot of hope that, you know, corruption will not win out and we not all live in, you know, Mad Max uh, uh, dystopia in the future, uh, that we can solve some of the problems that we're seeing worldwide with corruption right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, on-chain, yes, um, but not always voting. Um, and I would say, you know, ask yourself, what are the things we want an indelible record of for real, for sure? And don't put it on chain because it's cool. Resist that. Resist coolness. Do not try to be cool. Do, I'm sorry. Don't try to be cool. What you want, you want to be boring and predictable and trusted. Um, uh, a little rule of thumb is that most people only believe in governance 
if they've used it themselves, which means they probably want something that resembles their home country's uh, governmental system or what student government was like for them when they were kids. Mm -hmm. That's it. Anything else, it could be the most perfect, flawless, liquid democracy, cutting edge, sociocracy, teal, whatever. It could be awesome. But if it doesn't look like something they're familiar with, as soon as the stakes are real, they're like, yeah, no, I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. And you've just lost legitimacy. And without legitimacy, your governance dies. Legitimacy is the crown jewel. And you must preserve it at all costs. Uh, and that means you know, using systems and methods and approaches and names for things that your participants are familiar with. That's why, I, again, I'm gonna say it again, have the fire drill, make them use the system, make them find their key and plug it in and vote for something and make up a, a crisis, a small little tempest in a teapot and say, oh my God, oh my God, we're gonna lose a thousand dollars of overcharges if we don't, da, 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 da. quick, quick, you know, yeah. Little short-term panic never hurt anybody. And uh, it's, it's good practice mm -hmm. and it's a good rehearsal. Great, great. Um, the, the chat is amazing, by the way. I got to say, Carlos, yes. Dan, Chris. Uh, Misha, um, you have any question uh, as we have three minutes? Yeah. I have one question that uh, is even probably no, not a question. I, I would love to hear your opinion, guys. And uh, it's not a secret that there are many countries in the world that still do not consider electronic record as approved. Mm -hmm. There are many countries that where a judge will still trust more to the sworn person rather than to electronic record. So we have right now much bigger problem from government perspective, from legal perspective, uh, how we convince this society where this uh, like, oh, I believe more to someone who says, I swear it's true, rather than real electronic record, where the, this particular electronic record right now considered as like pure safe, okay? So what's your, what do you guys think about this? How we can address it? And uh, what action should be taken to help uh, society and governments and organizations that still follow this concept to, to believe it more in technology, believe more in the new governance that can be built on, on the foundation of the blockchain and leverage the beauty of, the, uh, of this technology. What, what do you think? Like, I would love personally to hear an opinion of all of you guys, like uh, just 30 seconds on that, each of you. Call me last, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Red is gonna go. I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I well the the first uh, kickoff of the thirty seconds. Um, I think Europe has a, a very interesting uh, place in the world. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. We have uh, all kinds of court systems in 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 The Hague. Um, so it's 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 about efficiency. Uh, it's about rule of law. Um, and, and yeah, I think some of those areas could outsource it to global arbitration systems um, step by step. If it's multi multinational, then yeah, a step like that could easily be made if the consortia members want that. Uh, there are re legal frameworks available. Um, so don't do it with local courts, do it with global arbitration bodies, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, from, from my side, uh, transnational projects are a completely different complexity. Uh, for a national one, particularly here in the, in the UAE, everybody has a regulator, right? So uh, in any private permission uh, blockchain, it's important to invite and to have the regulator as part of the uh, initial stages, at least of the, of the project. For example, we are talking a project in education, probably the Ministry of Education needs to, needs, uh, has something to say. If we are talking about a finance one, the UA Central Bank probably has something to say. As long as you uh, have the blessings of those uh, regulating bodies to move forward, then you have solved uh, a big part of the, of the problem, right? Because it's true that mm -hmm. still 
if you are trying to digitize documents, for example, probably there is a regulation saying that the physical copies of those documents are still required, right? So you need to have the body that is saying so, kind of accepting that uh, at some point, a digital copies need to be also enforceable. So it's important to have the regulator with you. And, and it's true that there are regulations uh, there that are not making things easy, but as long as you bring the regulator with you in the discussions, uh, you have at least uh, some blessings or some uh, directions on how to move forward. Thank you. Thomas? Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna say that judges are, um, don't necessarily evolve. Sometimes they're just replaced. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you may just have to wait for judge, certain judges to retire or that you know certain issues go to certain specialized courts where the judges have to have a certain amount of technical competence. Um, if you don't have the, the leverage to make that happen, you might have to bypass that country. Uh, or as uh, Rep very well pointed out, find a way to bypass the legal system using the arbitration system. Uh, the good news there is that um, I think 180 countries around the world have signed on to the UNCTRAL agreement, which means that international arbitration is binding in local courts by national treaty and national legislation. Um, so you can get court enforcement locally of an international arbitration rule, which is nice. Um, which is nice. Yeah, yeah the, good, the good news is that um, any problem you can imagine or any problem you run into has probably happened before. And someone probably has a workaround of some kind, and it's a matter of like, finding it. Um, and I, I remind people that in blockchain, especially, is that the, the issues we face are nothing new. They look new because of there's it's new technology. We call things by new names, but the underlying issues are ancient. Um, one of my favorite uh, thoughts on this from is something called polycentric law. Have any of you heard of polycentrism or polycentric law? I hadn't heard of it until very recently. Um, under old, under in the ancient Roman world. They had, they had uh, connected so many different um, cultures and so many different legal tr traditions that they just had this sort of meta tradition that any two parties could decide which, law, which legal system they were gonna work under for their dispute. And the Romans were like, no problem. And so you got, you know, like you got a, a guy from Gaul and a guy from Brittany and they're in Rome fighting and they wanna use the Gaulish legal systems. Like, great, go find someone to judge you who understands that make it happen, no problem. Um, and so we should easily be able to see in these chains as they get more and more extensive and more and more people doing things that at the contract level, you can say, yeah, we're gonna use system X. Um, and you record it on chain in advance because you don't wanna wait till your dispute happens to try to figure out how you're gonna resolve it. Please, please front load, front load your conversation about how disputes get resolved. Have boilerplate, have a default, have something. Um, there was a uh, case not long ago in, in the World Cup where it was a question of which country would advance to the next round of the World Cup. And uh, Japan was tied with, I forget who, and it was decided on how many yellow cards had been presented in, the, in prior games. Like that was the tiebreaker, it was the number of yellow cards. They were tied in every other metric. And the rule about yellow cards had been passed the year before but it had been written down, everyone agreed to it, and no one said it was a problem. And now it's, hey, look, we agreed to it last year, and now we're gonna apply it. It's like, oh, okay. But if, if you waited to the tie and said, okay, how are we gonna break the tie? They're gonna fight like cats and dogs to say, no, 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 I don't wanna use that criteria, I'll lose. I want the criteria where I win. And then mm -hmm. the other guy says, I'm not gonna agree to that. And then it's a fight. So front load your dispute resolution agreements, front load them. And Red is absolutely correct. International arbitration and mediation first is, is an excellent choice. Unfortunately, most transnational companies already understand that, so it should not be hard to yeah. get that set up. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, any closing thoughts? Yeah. I'll go with Red first. Yeah. Um, closing thoughts. Look at the governance, but also look at the technology that you're using. Uh, when we have 6% uh, success rate, then something terribly is wrong. Um, and it's not only governance, it's also the, the tech that you use. Um, I see a lot of projects just, okay, we want to do something here. Somebody suggested to use this or suggest to use that. No, do a, do a bake-off. Look at what technology is out there, who's, which companies are out there. Don't 
call IBM automatically, but look around a little bit before you make any decision. Mm -hmm. uh, George, thanks. Thanks for your input. Uh, right. Yeah. Any, uh, my final thoughts are any decision, technical decision, legal decision, uh, how to structure the construction decision, be inclusive. Uh, have everybody uh, as, as soon as possible in the, in the process. Because the last thing you want to have is that as you start working, there are uh, stakeholders that are slowing you down, that do not have uh, the, the right alignment in terms of the goals of the consortium, what is trying to achieve in terms of when needs to be ready. Uh, so it's, it's very important to be inclusive, have all the stakeholders, don't start the project if you don't have the right level of commitment from these stakeholders. And once you start, be inclusive. That's that's my final thought. Thomas, yeah. Uh, I would say um, take governance seriously. You may have to call it by a different name, but take stakeholder management seriously. Take the, the human factors side of this seriously. Uh, blockchains do not fail for technical reasons. They fail for human factors reasons. Um, I have uh, an entire governance consultancy and it is hard to get uh, people interested in this because they think it's a technology problem. The, your problems will not be technology problems. They'll be human factors problems. And you need a different set of skills at the table uh, and, and different experts. So uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. There's a lot of folks in this space who would be love to help you. Every, all the panelists on this call would love to talk to you uh, and, and give you, you know, free advice and, and cheer you on because we all want to see this succeed. Uh, I said before, you know, cooperation and love wins, and uh, I love being on the side of that. And so I know I'm, I, for one, and I'm sure everybody else on here would, would love to help you if you're listening to this, if you're attending, and you want to just like kick some thoughts around, reach out to us, get the help you need. Don't try to do this alone. This is a team sport. Great, great. Yeah. I like the concept uh, that this is the team sport, for sure, and uh, I do believe believe that first of all we the enterprises shouldn't try even to implement blockchain project just because it's a blockchain and uh, they don't don't even understand what problem uh, they're trying to solve okay so governance i would agree 100 percent it's probably one of the most important pieces yeah. and uh, uh, technology it's also important and uh, we actually have seen many projects that, uh, that failed. Uh, a lot of them failed because of the governance and the project that failed because of tech. In, man, in many cases, it was just some sort of penalty to the business why, why they didn't use the right tech. And I'm talking about dozens of millions of dollars uh, of penalties from, uh, from hackers in most cases. Okay, no, not even uh, the money that they invested in the project. Usually the penalty, it's much bigger and uh, introduced by hackers or dark net or some, um, like people from there rather than uh, like the cost of the project. And governance, yeah, like I, I would say uh, we really need to consider this as a team sport and uh, we need to have on the team multiple uh, expertise uh, or expertise from multiple dimensions. And I would definitely start with governance. I would start with business analysis. I would start with everything related to the business. Just understand the business challenge first before even going and uh, looking at what particular blockchain we need to, be, uh, to use, how it should be built, and so on, so on, so on. So really build a team, team sport, and go from there. This is my, my thought, final thought. Thanks, Michelle. Yes. Thank you for you know, uh, your whole time, but before we leave, as I mentioned, uh, this just note your calendars next year. Uh, hopefully, uh, everything will calm down and this is the time to meet face to face. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be Government Blockchain Week, uh, where more than 400 professionals, government and blockchain officials will come and meet in Capitol Hill. Uh, Don Tabs, Class, Coach, and Spot Stornida, and many others are going to be there, and professionals from Europe, America, and Asia. So I would love to thank the, the, uh, our experts. Uh, Thomas, you're fantastic. Uh, I realize you're a fantastic multidisciplinary thinker, which very, very few thinkers are there. Um, and uh, it's, it's great that you're switching 
to to different domains, expertise in different domains. So thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, uh, Red. Thanks, uh, George and Misha for attending. And thanks the audience uh, for, and if you have any questions or feedback, please email us at info at gbaua.org and join our LinkedIn and uh, keep updated with, with the different topics we have. So yeah, have a great day, everybody. Thank you for hosting this Thank very, very much. Thanks. Thanks.